And we ask God that we are present to you first and after the day. And we ask that you continue to be that and direct us and keep us on the right path. In the name of the Father. And you taught us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trust us. Dr. Hilbert Finnis, Peter Turnquist, Brent Simonet, Desmond Bannister, Renwood Wells, Jeffrey Lloyd, Dr. Duane Sands, Marvin Dean, Frankie Campbell, Dionisio Diagula, Michael Pinsard, Darren Hensfield, Ramal Ferrero, Lanisha Roll, Renzo Roll, Elsworth Johnson, Philip Davis, Vaughn Miller, Takisha Parker Edson, Iron Lewis, Carlton Bolag, James Audrey, Travis Robinson, Adrian Gibson, Donald Sanders, Frederick Maffel Pine, Hank Johnson, Mark Hume, Michael Coates, Miriam Rathley Emanuel, Reese Shipman, Ruben Ramming, Ricky Matthew, Shannon Don Cartwright, Sean L. Ferguson, Glennon Hannah Martin, Kaiser Ford, Chester Cooper. Good morning, members. Let me first start by saying Happy Valentine's Day to all of you, I know Valentine's Day is normally for women, but we, I always think that Valentine's Day is for everyone. So happy Valentine's Day, happy Valentine's Day Bahamas on behalf of the members of this honorable house. Introduction and swearing in of new members, laying of documents by ministers, statements and communication by ministers, communication by the clerk, messages from the governor general, Messages from the Senate, motion for leave of absence, leave to resign, see, and new writs. Presentations of petitions, presentations of reports of committees, adoptions of records, adoptions of report of committees, first reading of bills, second reading and committal of bills, the chair recognizes the member for Yamacraw. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me say what a delight it is this morning uh, to rise on behalf of the great constituency of Yamacraw to begin debate on uh, the Commercial Enterprise Substance Requirement Act 2019. And Mr. Speaker, as we all very well know, the uh, activities surrounding the financial uh, sector in the Bahamas is not of recent vintage, Mr. Speaker. And while preparing for my presentation this morning, I came across uh, the, the uh, document prepared by the Bahamas Financial Services Board, the Bahamas Approach to the Common Reporting Standards, uh, government briefing document. And Mr. Speaker, this document was uh, constituted by one Ms. Tanya McCartney, CEO and Executive Director of the ba Bahamas Financial Services Board. And what she did in this document is she highlighted the, the historical context of the Bahamas' interaction with the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And she starts from where it first began around 2019, and she highlights in the document, Mr. Deputy, all of the efforts that was taken by the Bahamas until this document was prepared by him in May 2017. One of the things she highlighted, Mr. Speaker, in this document and representing the industry is that the financial services sector is so important to 
the Bahamas, and it represents, I think, 15% of, of the employment sector in the Bahamas. And she had asked at that stage when one Mr. Carl W. Bethel was then in the Senate. He was in the Senate. She'd advise him <coughs> that this matter should not be politicized, but that there should be some collaboration and consultation between the <coughs> FNM who was then in the opposition and the then governing party, Progressive Liberal Party. But she highlight, highlights in the document that on, 18, on, the, on April 18, 2017, uh, there was a visit by Mr. Pascal St. Adam uh, uh, Arms. I'm hoping that I'm correcting it right, the director for Santa for Tax Policy and Administration of the OECD. And that there, a meeting would, was held with the then cabinet and uh, the opposition on the Bahamas position and, and its relationship with the OECD. She also made mention that on April 2000, April 26, 2017, an industry briefing was held. Uh, and the industry was again uh, uh, informed of what was necessary. And so, Mr. Speaker, we see that where we are today, uh, that we, we did not just arrive here, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this bill is as a result of further comments made on the law we passed in 2018 and reflects changes suggested by the European Union's Code of Conduct Group. The group had concerns about certain provisions in the law, largely concerned with the provisions, largely concerned with the definition of tax residence, proof of tax residence, and certain carve-outs from the limitations on which what is called outsourcing, particularly in favor of accounting firms. And Mr. Speaker, I begin my, present, my debate this morning by highlighting the report presented by Ms. Tanya McCartney, uh, the CEO for the Bahamas Financial, Bahamas Financial Services Board because I wanted to underscore the fact that where we are today is, is, is as a direct uh, response to public consultation with industry partners, also uh, a reach out to international, uh, uh, international advisors on this matter. And so we've arrived at a piece of legislation that we think will set the Bahamas on the right course in terms of the commercial and the substance requirement bill. Pursuant to the Act, as passed, every formerly offshore entity which is incorporated or registered and our company is registered is required to conduct its business, have employees and, office and offices, or at least have board meetings and take strategic decisions in the Bahamas. The amendments, in some cases, take the Bahamas to the same level as in the case in competing jurisdictions, who are also the subject of this process. So other jurisdictions have imposed substance requirements on non-company business arrangements, such as common law partnerships and other forms of limited liability and exempted liability partner partnerships. This amendment takes the Bahamas to the same position adopted by other jurisdictions by including partnerships as potentially being included entities which are required to prove economic substance in the Bahamas. However, as the amendment defines tax residence in the Bahamas so that any entity, company, or partnership which is wholly beneficially owned by someone who resides and is domiciled in the Bahamas or which is owned by an annual or permanent resident and who physically lives in the Bahamas for, for at least three months in every calendar year, companies or partnerships owned by ordinary residents are not included entities and so do not have to comply with the Act. 
The amendment also removes certain carve-outs from the restrictions on outsourcing, particularly in favor of accounting firms. No competing jurisdiction had a similar carve-out, and the Code of Conduct Group had grave concerns about such blanket carve-outs. Lastly, the amendments in this bill will require competent authority to spontaneously report to tax jurisdictions of beneficial owners or any entity which engage in high-risk intellectual property activity, such as charging royalties or, or li license fees for use of patented or trademark properties or products. These royalty fees are considered to be the subject are considered to be the subject to subject to tax avoidance abuse, particularly when used to shift profits among a group of associated companies. The bill also defines a species of non-included entities as being entities registered or incorporated in the Bahamas, which are centrally managed or controlled in the third country. These are a specific type of non-included entity. This non-included entity is to be found in the law of all our competing, ju competing jurisdictions and has been approved by the Code of Conduct Group. However, the competent authority is required to spontaneously report to the tax jurisdiction of the beneficially o o beneficial owner and also the claim tax jurisdiction of the entity. I should point out that this issue of spontaneous reporting was only raised after the bill had been tabled and the day the same was being debated and so could not be incorporated into the path into the law passed in December because it was only raised at the very last moment minute. As for passive holding companies, we improved the competitive position of the Bahamas by removing references to collective investment entities such as mutual or investment funds from the definition of passive holding companies. They are specifically included by the, by the amendment, amendment. Mr. Speaker, last week the Attorney General and a delegation traveled to Brussels, Belgium. As a part of his mission, he also met with the Code of Con Conduct Group. In agreeing to advance these amendments, the Attorney General received, received assurances that these amendments, that these amendments, the Code of Conduct Code of Conduct Group would be able to make a positive recommendation on behalf of the Bahamas. The process was explained that firstly it is, it is a technical evaluation, not a political decision. And that is the process as to whether or not the Bahamas will be included or excluded from any listing. Once the laws of the Bahamas pass the technical evaluation, a positive recommendation would likely be made to the EU of ministers, ministers of finance. The practice is that the ministers do not debate the report of the Code of Conduct Group, but vote silently. The clear suggestion is that the recommendation of the Code of Conduct Group are generally accepted by the EU ministers. We have every reason to believe, to be confident that if we are able through these amendments to meet the technical criteria set by the Code of Con Conduct Group, we should not, in the ordinary course of things, suffer any disadvantage. I should also point out that these amendments, as I said earlier, Mr. Speaker, in substance have been shared with the financial sector leadership and that at a meeting held at the office of the Prime Minister on Monday evening, the same were unanimously agreed by the large assembled representatives of virtually every major bank and trust company in the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, with your leave, I'll just take you through the provisions of the bill. Mr. Speaker, amendment sec the am amendment of section two of the principal act. Is section two of the principal act is being amended and, and the definition of commercial entities is being widened to include companies, to, com uh, to include and, and is an entity incorporated, registered, or continued under the Companies Act, the International Business Companies Act, Partnership Act, Partnership Limited Liability Act, and Exempted Limited Liability Act. 
Mr. Speaker, the commercial entities does not include an entity under uh, paragraph A and E, which is resident on in the Bahamas and conducts its core income generating activities in the Bahamas, or two, is centrally managed and can control outside the Bahamas and is tax regist registered in a jurisdiction other than the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, the defi there's also a definition of non-included entities, regulated entities, resident-owned entities is also defined. Outsourcing, there's a there's section six. There's a repeal and replacement of section six of the principal act. Section six of the principal act is repealed and replaced by an outsourcing, outsourcing of core income generating activities and it places limitation on that. There's an amendment to section seven, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the head notes of success, section seven of the principal act is amended by the deletion of the word management and control and substance and the, and the substance, sub, substitution of the word direction and management. Mr. Speaker, Section 10 of the Principal Act is repealed, and there's also, uh, and this deals with reporting requirements, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I said when I started, I would not keep you or take very long this morning. These are brief, uh, significant uh, uh, amendments to the Commercial Entity Substance Requirement Bill. And without more, Mr. Speaker, that is my submission. Thank you. As many do, we have a second. Chair recognizes the member for Senegal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's always a pleasure to speak on any sort of, any piece of legislation before the House when you represent uh, people. And I want to thank the people of Satterville for this opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I stand to second this amendment bill. As I have the most confidence in our industry professionals and the professionals at the Ministry of Financial Services, that they would have done the best they could. My presentation will not go into the technical aspects as the amendment does speak to the management of outsourcing in our business as well as tax residency. The original act which was passed in December, would have mentioned the physical presence and reporting requirements. My presentation, Mr. Speaker, will speak to what I believe the future of our relationship with international bodies should look like. The report that we would have had in 2017, the National Risk Assessment, would have spoken to strategic deficiencies in our AML CFT programs and therefore, I believe we ought to have strategic solutions. As former Prime Minister Sir Lyndon would have said in one of his presentations, look up, the world is watching. So I'd like to remind parliamentarians and financial services colleagues that the world continues to watch. The Bahamas would have passed the commercial entities Substance Requirements Act in December of 2018. Time and time again, Mr. Speaker, when I would make uh, presentations, I would come to the House of Assembly and admonish, admonish my peers and colleagues about legislation that has an international impact, or any legislation for that matter. Notwithstanding that today we will debate the amendments, I will in this presentation make reference to my initial contribution on the original act passed in 2018. Time and time again, 
politicians would say that they would have met with industry and thought they would have come up with the best approach possible to save the financial services industry. Yet the goal post continues to move. The goal post moves, Mr. Speaker, because we continue to bring our bills to the House of Parliament without the necessary regulations. The goal post moves, Mr. Speaker, because our governments have not embraced a national quality assurance program in the second pillar of our economy, the financial services industry. The goal post continues to move, Mr. Speaker, because our secondment programs are not being utilized effectively in the business of financial services. What the financial services industry should be pushing for, in my opinion, is not just for the bill or the act, but for the regulations to accompany those acts. The regulations, Mr. Speaker, are the rules to be followed to ensure that we are in compliance with the act. Then there should be guidelines and established policies and procedures to ensure the framework creates a financial culture that is compliant but progressive. The industry should be pushing for an adequately funded quality assurance program so that legislation, policies, and guidelines are functionable and not functionless. Corporate governance structures, inclusive of the cabinet, should be aware of the financial services business, inclusive of product details, the industry, Mr. Speaker, should be pushing for measured secondment programs where people who are actually in offshore financial services are seconded to regulators and regulators to industry for at least a year. Those, Mr. Speaker, are the issues. It doesn't matter what they may say or how the politics will spin it. The bottom line is we are not protecting and preserving our people. Because if we were, we would not have the brain drain that we do. The developed countries want what we have, and I mean that in all aspects. In most cases, they get what they want because of the way we are treating each other. Mr. Speaker, the world is watching. The world knows, inclusive of the IDB and OECD and international stakeholders, when we are not complying with our own obligations, or when we are not complying with our own laws. The world knows, Mr. Speaker, when we do not have a substantive post like Chief Justice Phil. The world knows when the respect for law and order is at an all-time low. The world knows, Mr. Speaker, when our parliament we're passing laws without necessary regulations, and when the government quality assurance program is non-existent. You just have to look at the budget and see how much money is allocated to quality assurance. We must present, Mr. Speaker, politicians to the EU and the G20 more seasoned in their respective authorities. It is time, Bahamas, it is time, Mr. Prime Minister, where meritocracy is put above loyalty, country above self. Meritocracy, not just in education, but in standards and in integrity. That's quality assurance. Jobs will not cut it for the future of the Bahamas. Careers is what we, are what we need. Careers are sustainable, and careers build nations. That's quality assurance. So what can we expect from this, this move? More industry fallout, more international reporting requirements, and so, what can we do to protect, preserve, and promote our industry? We must remain competitive, Mr. Speaker. We must train, train, and continue training. We must legislate continuing education. Acts passed in Parliament must be accompanied by regulations. We must map out Bahamian ownership in financial services through education. We must create a small business development arm in the Ministry of Financial Services. Adequate budget for quality assurance and training programs that can be measured. We must set the tone at the top, Mr. Speaker, from the cabinet level. Meritocracy over loyalty. 
that's when we will start to get the Bahamas we really need. Meritocracy, that's when the brain, brain drain will stop. Meritocracy, that's when we will get the respect of our people and the world. It's as simple as that. A system of meritocracy, not loyalty, though loyalty is important. We must know who we are in financial services. We are specialists from international regulatory, regulatory compliance. We are capital market operators, financial and banking evangelists, portfolio and asset management offshore consultants. We must continue to be capable, competitive, and ready to do business. Regulators, as I would have stated in the House before, must not let politics be counterproductive to progress. We must not let career politicians or power-seeking individuals move us away from our expressed vision and mission, which is to make the Bahamas the number one financial services center in the world. We must embrace the reality of a vibrant capital markets. We must continue to regulate, but educate our people. We must continue to endorse as we enforce press, as we stress the need to be a people capable of driving home what it takes to be a sovereign, successful nation. For many years, multinational and commercial entities that fit this framework would have been given tax incentives, exemptions, and concessions that the Bahamian people could never quantify. In my opinion, a lack of transparency in heads of agreements and no requirement for substantive reporting. Now that the EU and the OECD see a need to quantify even the incentives given to these commercial and multinational corporations, it gives us a way to quantify the real benefits to our economy and our people of foreign direct investments. Once the developed countries ascertain and quantify registered exemptions, concessions, and or tax breaks they are better able to calculate eroding profits and intellectual property revenue. In my opinion, one of our major advantages here in the Bahamas is our sovereign laws, but we must uphold them starting with in here. I welcome these laws, this act, and its amendments, though it will come with some disadvantages. The advantages, however, are far-reaching, and over time, I believe the Bahamian people will see why we are in this position we find ourselves in today. This law will bring about systemic changes as international organizations continue to put pressure on us to give information on multinational companies making hundreds of millions abroad while at the same time obtaining hundreds of millions in concessions. This, Mr. Speaker, in the developed world is known as the cost of privilege, where the tax breaks and concessions given to the wealthy ends up being a cost to those less fortunate. I have hope that the new Bahamas order will transition us from a nation that is dependent on politics to a nation who can depend on ourselves. When we can depend on ourselves, it means we have reliance on God. When you rely on God, you vote in the best interests of his people, which includes the Commonwealth of Bahamas. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I second this amendment bill, and may God continue to bless the Commonwealth of Bahamas. As many, Chair recognizes the member for St. Anne's. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here, we have no other. Speakers, so I'll raise at this moment to wrap up the second reading of the bill before us today. I was glad to hear the comments from the member for Centerville and also the very learned comments from the minister, member for Yamakra, my neighbor in, in the east, who laid out the whole issue of where we are with financial services. When we came to office in 2017, let me go back a little bit further. When I was in office in the 2000s and the financial service industry came under a serious attack, the Bahamas, under the then Prime Minister Ingram, passed a 
compendium of bills that brought the country in line with what was then the status quo for financial services. At that time, you had people like Rowena Bethel, well-known, uh, working for us, and you're talking about very qualified people. That's, that's one of them that I single out there, who uh, she had more frequent flyer miles than probably any of us put together. She went around the world trying to deal with this whole question of the moving of the goalposts. And the goalposts in financial services continue to move and continue to move. Still. And still moving, yes, even, even this morning or this yes. afternoon, but this morning here, this afternoon in Europe. And so we, start, we thought we had done what we needed to do. We, you know, that was the next, we all talk about difficulty of opening bank accounts. That's where that all started. You know, the, that whole compendium of legislation made it very difficult to open bank accounts because it was then the requirement. Uh, we got rid of bearer shares uh, from, from, the, from the face of the, the Companies Act was amended. Mind you, a state to the north of us still has bearer shares. Um, you talk about concessions. I go to promote the Bahamas around the world in financial services, and I'm next to uh, Dakota and Wyoming and places like that that have hundred-year yeah, yeah, I was trying. Uh, yeah, hundred-year <laughs> tax concessions, but we can't. We can't do it. So these are the whole issues. So we went down. We, then we fast forward to 2017. Government change. The first thing that that, um, and I don't mean this to be political because the side opposite on here. The first thing that hit us was a whole question of some international tax concessions. The former government, Mr. Ryan Pinder's minister, thought it would be easier to do bilateral agreements with different countries, and he had a certain, the country had a certain time to do those bilateral agreements. Time ran out. We came into government. We took a strategic view that we would go with the multilateral, and Deputy Prime Minister and myself, when you talk about uh, persons traveling, uh, went, were in um, San Marino and Paris and signed on to the multilateral convention in, for tax consequences, which was the first step we started in this administration. That led into uh, CRS, which is actually co common reporting standards. I know it has other areas, other than, which was a whole issue where the banks had to, and trust companies had to start on exactly what that meant, was a, a common reporting standard whereby we could exchange information with, I think it's 38 or 39 countries around the world. So if they came looking for a bank account for Mr. X or Mr. Y, they were from Switzerland or from France, we would exchange information in a very protected, protected way. Common reporting standards then led into BEPS, um, Base Erosion Profit Shifting, which is, as the member for Centerville said, that's where you know the, the typical one they usually use, I think is Starbucks or one of those that makes $100 million in Ireland um, and around the world and only pays $10,000, whatever the figures are. You know. But it was where a country uses another country's tax structure to base their, their business to avoid paying taxes in countries where they're doing the business. So we, had, we adopted four of the 15 requirements under the BEPS, which were the only four that could apply to us. So it wasn't like we could apply to all 15 because they just didn't apply. So we, we did the four, the four uh, under minimum requirements under BEPS, and again, the banks were required to do certain, uh, certain pr procedures. They had to upgrade their computer systems. We had to upgrade our computer. We had to train people, retrain people on all this reporting, reporting requirement. We passed a bill in here that affects, I think, revenue of $850 million is when it, per year is when that company begins to be affected by that, by that legislation. So we all moved down. That, that area. We came then, um, Deputy Prime Minister myself made several trips to between Brussels and Paris, and then the Deputy Prime Minister myself and the Attorney General made a, several trips to, to Brussels. And we took, talked with the technocrats over there. We have numerous emails going backwards and forwards. And this, this, this legislation was crafted. We thought we got to the point where we were at, the, at that point, we brought the commercial substance bill here. PM and, and Dep uh, PM and AG went to Paris again, and P AG went to Paris again. And we now have the amendments that are here. The member for Centerville talked about um, uh, consultation. This was done a lot, all along the road. I think the last trip to Paris, members of the private sector went with, um, with the Attorney General. Several of my trips, I had Tanya, Bas Tanya McCartney, who's head of the Bahamas Financial Services Board, of which all the, these mem 
and a member from Associated International Banks and Trust, AIBT, and they were all in the meetings with us drafting. As a matter of fact, we had, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the group of people who actually worked on the legislation, many from the private sector, many from the public sector, the wonderful uh, drafts people at the AG's office, and all of us worked together late into the night, many times on a Saturday and a Sunday, drafting this legislation, sending it to Paris, uh, sending it to Brussels, it would come back, we'd have conference calls, we'd have industry meetings, either the Attorney General, the DPM, myself, or all three of us, we met consistently, up even to Saturday, Sunday night, this Sunday night at 7 p.m., where the Prime Minister, myself, and the Attorney General met with 40 members, the top executives from the industry, um, at the PM's office to talk about these exact same amendments we've brought here today. They were au okay fait with them. We, we sent them out to them ahead of time. We had their feedback with some other changes, and this is what the product has a result of today. So there was a very deep consultative process to get to here. As the member for Yamacro says, we think we've got to the point where the um, Code of Conduct and the OEC, the EU, will accept what we're trying to do. We've leveled the playing field with our partners, whether it's Bermuda, Cayman, uh, the others, and we, we, think we, we think we are where we, need, where we need to be. Constant goalposts moving. We think we've got, we think we've won the, we've, we've shot the, the winning goal on this one. Um, we will know possibly towards the end of this month, the middle of next month, whether our works have, have been successful. As the member of Senneville said, there's a, an interesting voting process. It's silent. It goes through recommendations. We're led to believe that by the, by the persons who make the recommendations that we've done all we have to do, and the recommendation will go forth favorably, favorably and will be approved. So by passing this today, and we are doing it in a slight bit of a hurry because there is a deadline. We, the Senate is meeting today, as you've seen from outside. They will deal with the first reading of this, the second reading and passing tomorrow. It'll go to the Governor General. It'll be assented to, gazetted, and we need to get it to Brussels by Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday of next week to make the deadline for this process. So we've done what we've done. All along, we have had great cooperation from the, from the EU, great cooperation from our, our side. We think we've done what we've had to do. Senator made mention of uh, regulations. Going along with this commercial enterprise bill are some guidance notes, regulations by any other name. And the guidance notes under this, re under this law will have the effect of law, even though they're regulations or guidance notes. And that's where the real meat of this bill is. That, that has been going backwards and forwards to industry for several times. I mean, we're on like, I don't know, the 50th version of it or whatever. We seem to, and tweaking it to make sure that the meat and substance of the regulations are in this bill. So this, this is one of these bills that is actually happening simultaneously, but I understand we mean quite often the regula regulations come out a long time later. We hope those regulations will be finished, I think today or tomorrow, we'll hopefully send them out um, after public consultation and move on, and that will form part of, of this exercise whereby we will go forward. So I think we've done, we've done that. We've appointed an ambassador to Brussels so, uh, so there will be someone over there to have a total liaison. A lot of the countries don't have it. Some countries do. So we have a constant dialogue with, with persons. And we would, uh, that, that representative should be in place. And we're giving her technical support in terms of support staff. We do have staff in Geneva that are very competent. Um, two, two members of, of foreign affairs, well, one member of foreign affairs, one member of finance who are in the Geneva office, who constantly liaise, and also London. Yeah, 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 and, the, and an officer in, in foreign affairs in London, who are on top of this uh, me, um, process. Uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, I just at this point pause. The Prime Minister was here earlier. He had to fly to um, one of the fam Chub Key for a function and also to, to, um, to christen the new Bahamas Air. 737 that is as part of the part of the fleet so he apologizes for not being here and the deputy prime minister is actually out of the country on a financial services um, conference just on that point so there's people listening and i know i'm, I'm going on a, a little long by trying to bring us up to speed financial services is regulate is is managed once you get under uh, out of the out of the prime minister and the cabinet level by three three ministers so the actual a competent authority for a lot of this legislation is the Minister of Finance. So he, ha he has the carriage for quite a number of the 
the, the competent authority. The Attorney General is the competent authority for Financial Action Task Force. I mention that because I think you've seen something come out on FATF in the last couple of days, and I'll address that in short order. And in my case, I'm responsible for financial services in the marketing and development and promotion. The three of us work very closely together, and we have, we have, we're very fortunate we do get on very well, and we put together what we think is probably the best piece of legislation we can have. So I'd like to thank my two colleagues in that regard. Speaker, I mentioned, I mentioned FATF. An announcement has come out recently. Many of you might have seen in the United States made a comment with regard to the FATF. Yes, they did. did. <laughs> they made a comment. Um, we, the, and as it relates to the Bahamas, you know, we hear these words, blacklist, gray list, this list, that list, whatever. If I can go back in time, in 2000, I think it was 17 or 18, the Attorney General, the current Attorney General was in Europe to hear the peer review on the 2015, 2015 FATF report. So when we first had that peer report uh, based on 2015, the year 2015 report, it came out after the election. I'm not putting any political, I'm just putting a timeline. So a different attorney general was there. We got certain number of issues where we were either not compliant, not fully compliant, and all these, all these words they, they used. But, um, you know, since then, and apologies to my Mr. Chairman, you know, we have done a number of acts. We've done the Proceeds of Crime Act 2018. Many of you may remember we did this uh, nickname POCA, yeah. the Proceeds of Crime Act. We did the Financial, Financial Transaction Reporting Act 2018. We did the Anti-Terrorism Act 2018, the Traveler's Currency Declaration Amendment Act 2018. You know, sometimes they say we don't do anything in this place, but these are acts that we did in 2018. The Financial Transaction Reporting Regulation, the Financial Transaction Wire Transfers Regulations 2018, the Register of Beneficial Ownership. And that was a big one, because what they're trying to do is make sure, those of you lawyers, that the ownership of these companies becomes public record so that people can come in and take a look at it. We opted for a semi, uh, a non-public record, so only persons who are authorized by a competent authority of another country could come into this jurisdiction, ask our competent authority, we, we get the information for them and send it out. So it's not open to the, the, the world to go and look up as it is, let's say, if you want to look up, um, let's say, Town Center Mall, just to use that, you can go to the registry and look it up and up will pop my name. So that won't happen with international companies. It'll be a restricted, only person uh, authorized to ask that information. Can we do the beneficial ownership? And then, and in doing all of that, we ended up with uh, CFADF, which is the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, as opposed to FATF, Financial Action Task Force, just the one relating to the region. We ended up that we, in, in uh, most of them, we were largely compliant, partially compliant, uh, uh, partially compliant to compliant. We started getting very good on, on 20 of 18 of the 32 regulations. So we have moved to the, the goalpost to make sure we've done that and we tried our best to become uh, compliant with the FATF, CFATF regulations. And the Attorney General has met in Paris with them, as, as I have, with regard to, and we have a guideline that we've uh, uh, told the Europeans, by this date we'll do this, by this date we'll do that. And you'll see rolling out in very short order uh, a strengthening of the financial action, financial information, what is it, financial, um, Anyway, the, the, it, the intelligence part and, the, and the, the, the implementation part, because that's really where the CFADF and FAT, is, Financial Intelligence Unit, thank you. And we'll be strengthening them with getting more staff, more capability. You've seen strengthening of the uh, Minister of Finance's ministry where he's hired new people with regard to strengthening his ability. In my office, we've had um, some extra uh, uh, persons come in, so on and so forth, all in an attempt to provide the compliance side. So one is passing the laws which we're doing today, and the other will be the following up on the terms of the compliance. Just by way of, of information, the Attorney General's office today is looking at a new computer program which will hopefully modernize the company's register, which need, does need a lot of help so that we can get in there and get out of there very quickly with regard to, to managing companies. So, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, on, in, ra in wrapping up this bill, A, I, I hope I've, I've portrayed that it is necessary, the speed, 
um, it's unfortunate that members opposite are, are not here to uh, debate this issue. We think we've reached the optimum. It'll be sent off to, London, uh, off to Brussels on first thing month, Tuesday or Wednesday when the Senate finishes with it and the Governor General, Her Excellency, signs off on it. We think we've met the deadline. We'll have to wait and see what, when the uh, EU uh, Council of Ministers meets as to whether they give their nod of assent. But you can rest assured that the government of the Bahamas is committed, fully committed to making sure we do everything within the sovereignty of our country to make sure that the financial services industry is protected. Um, it is a very interesting time in that area because not only the goalposts are moving, but they want our things, if I can put it that way. They want to make sure they get our business. We are a very well-regulated uh, country. We're a very high professional that work here. We've dealt with over the years of making sure the accounts that are here are high net worth, high um, good accounts. Um, we've worked at making sure that those accounts that shouldn't be here have left the jurisdiction. We've done most things that are po possible, sometimes to the detriment of, of, of all of us. So for instance, when it gets very difficult to open a bank account, you really get frustrated, and hopefully the banks will, will loosen up on that. There's that request, that requirement to know your customer. That came out of the 2000, uh, 2000 the, uh, the whole financial shift there. And we've felt it. We've all felt it. You got to open a bank account, you got to bring your birth certificate, your passport, your... <laughs> and that's part of all that. So we, we have become, we have tr done our best to be compliant, successive government. We've done our best to make sure we have a high quality book here. I think sometimes there's a, a, a consideration that we have more assets under management than we do. We are not a large money laundering area. Those are countries, which I won't name, but they're elsewhere in the world, that have that ability. So I trust that what we've done today with the consent of the House is that we've passed a amendment to the legislation which we think will, will pass mustard, and the Bahamas can go back to promoting the best little country in the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Sinan. As many. As many. As many members are in favor of remain seated. Those opposing will rise. The motion is carried and committed. Order that the bill be read a second time. A bill for an act to amend the Commercial Entity Substance Requirements Act 2018. Wait a second. For the second reading. Yeah, I don't want for the second reading, uh, Mr. Deputy. I do not move that the House resolves itself into Committee of the Whole with the member from St. Barnabas in the chair. I second that. It's being moved and seconded that the House resolve itself to the Committee of the Whole mm -hmm. with the uh, member for St. Barnabas in the chair. As many in favor remain seated, those opposing will rise. The House will resolve into the Committee of the Whole with the member for St. Barnabas as chair. of the whole. Chairman, I move the long title of the commercial, a bill for an act to amend the Commercial Entities Substance Requirements Act 2019. It's been moved and seconded that the long title be agreed. Those who are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will rise. Long title is agreed. Mr. Chairman, I move the short title of this act may be cited as the Commercial Entities Substance Regulation Amendment Act 2019. It's been moved and seconded that the short title be agreed. Those who are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will rise. The short title is agreed. Mr. Chairman, I move that clauses two to 12 be, um, be, be agreed, sorry. 
Seven, it has been moved and seconded that clauses 2 through 12 be agreed. Those are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will rise. Mr. Chairman, I move that the bill in its entirety now be agreed. Bill in its entirety be agreed. It's been moved and seconded that the bill be agreed in its entirety. Those who are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will rise. The bill is agreed in its entirety. Chair now recognizes the honorable member for Bamboo Town. Mr. Chair, I do now move that the deputy speaker, the acting speaker, do take the chair. It has been moved and seconded that the deputy speaker do now take the chair. Those who are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will rise. It is agreed that the deputy speaker now do take the chair. Hmm? Huh? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I beg now leave to report that the committee has met and gone for the bill, having made no amendment thereto. <laughs> Members, uh, the acting chair has reported that the members have gone through, the committee has gone through uh, the bill, making no amendments thereto. Third reading and passing bill. Mr. Speaker, I move the third reading and passing of a bill for an act to amend the Commercial Entity Substance Requirements Act. Being moved and seconded, there'll be a third reading of the bill. As many members are in favor, remain seated. Those opposing will rise. It's agreed, the third reading. Hmm. Sorry. I move that the bill do not pass. Yeah. It's being moved and seconded that the bill, that the third reading be, be read a third time. The bill be read a third time. As many members that are in favor will remain seated, those opposing will rise. It's ordered that the bill be read a third time. A bill for an act to amend the Commercial Entities Substance Requirement Act 2018. Order. It's ordered that the bill be to pass. A bill for an act to amend, and the title be declared, the Commercial Entities Subsidies Requirement Amendment Act, ah, 2019. As many. Chair recognizes the member for Bamboo Town. There are no further third readings. Consideration of Senate amendments. Resolutions. Member statements. The chair recognizes the member for Southern Shores. Mr. Speaker, I rise always humbly and grateful to the good people of Southern Shores. Um, I rise on this particular occasion, though, to say how pleased I am <laughs> to be present and participating in today's proceedings. Um, and to see yourself and our young brother from St. Barnabas, to see that the country can see that you are not just sitting here taking up space, but you are paying attention to the proceedings sufficiently so that you are able to so smoothly navigate us uh, through the process. <laughs> This, this augurs well for the future of this, country, of this country, the future of this parliament, and I'm satisfied that it must be inspiring for all of our young people out there watching. I just want to say, happy Valentine's Day, Bahamas. 
member statements as many. The chair recognizes the member for Senegal. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just want to say happy Valentine's Day to my lovely wife, Tara, and also the, our kids. Condolences, I, I'd like to say condolences to quite a number of families in Centerville, especially Miss Hattie Goodman. She's the past president of the Centerville Senior Citizens Association. I also want to say congratulations to Miss Candace Marshall and Miss Debbie Deal and their team at the Centerville Primary School on the creation of a playground for the children. The initiative actually was um, private sector driven and we appreciate their assistance. Even though the issue for me, uh, Mr. Speaker, is still the buildings of uh, the schools in the Centerville constituency. The Centerville constituency will engage a firm to assess the school buildings in the Centerville area for structural and safety deficiencies. Palmdale Primary, Columbus Primary, Sandville Primary, Stephen Dillett, along with Donald Davis uh, High School. It is my personal vision, Mr. Speaker, to see newly built public schools in the inner city with the necessary sporting facilities and safety facilities to allow our children to maximize their potential. Mr. Speaker, at some point, we here and every other Bahamian must ask ourselves a fundamental question. It may be a question of morals. It may be a question of ethics. It may be a question of principle. That question, Mr. Speaker, is who are we? Just in case some Bahamians did not hear it, who are we? Are we FNMs? Are we PLPs? Are we Bahamians? Are we, are we, are we? And the list goes on. What I know I am, and what I know you are, and what I know the people of Centerville are, and what I know the Bahamian people are, is better than this. Mr. Speaker, as I, pre as I close, a scripture comes to mind. What does it profit a man to gain this whole world and lose his soul? What is the soul of the Bahamian people? What is my soul? What is your soul? And finally, every month, Mr. Speaker, Sandoval acknowledges Bahamians that in our judgment took a course of action that transcends politics and taps into a benefit to the next generation. And our thumbs up award for the month of February will go to Magistrate Joanne Ferguson Pratt. Sandoval wants her and the judiciary to know that we appreciate those of you who continue to do what you need to do to make this Bahamas a better place. Thank you. As many. Further member statements, appointment of select committees, instructions to select committees, discharge of select committees, Notices for future meetings. Mr. Yes. Mr. Chair recognizes the member for Bamboo Town. I rise to renew all matters in the name of the government and to, I'm tempted, but we're on a different point here. So I will simply say that I will move that the House adjourns until February 20th, Wednesday, at 10 a.m., 2019. Being moved and seconded that the House adjourn to the 20th of February at 10 a.m. As many members that are in favor remain seated. Those opposing will rise. Move that the House do adjourn. The motion is carried. Final adjournment. Mr. Deputy, I do not move that the House adjourns until 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 20th of February, 2019. You on the job or not? <laughs> <laughs> it's, being moved, it's being moved 
<laughs> Being moved and seconded that this honorable house adjourn to the 20th of February, 2019 at 10 a.m. This house now stands adjourned to the 20th of February, 2019 at 10 a.m.